we're live. Hello there. Hi, it's here we are on October the 10th, the 10th of the 10th month of, of 2024. Um, glad you could join us tonight and even going forward if you're not with us at this moment, but where you can join us online at your convenience. Um, we're grateful for this time and this place. We're grateful that um, we're grateful to the Lord that uh, we live in this country of freedom where we can freely share the gospel, where we can freely share the word of God and do these studies. So we just want to say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. And bless you as you come along with us tonight. And I, I just, uh, you know, nothing is perfect, as you will know, um, based on if you've watched it, any and come along with us on any of these studies. Um, but it's like, let's just have a talk. Let's have a, you know, our small group together. And um, I think that's, you know, when we're with Jesus, you know, we, we talk to him. And we talk with him, and it's about just being ourselves. So come along as yourself, and um, uh, we'll come along here together, those of us that are here. And I'm going, I am going to start with the, um, an opening prayer for dealing with demonic. Mm. And so I know you've heard it almost every time, but it's good to set, to set those places so that the enemy realizes who exactly is in charge no matter where you are in the world, he, he is subject to the authority and the lordship of Jesus Christ to those of us who Jesus is Lord. So I just say, Lord, as you and whether it be Ralph or Ray or whoever is among us, just to insert your name, Lord, as you and each one of us are establishing an interactive connection, I also ask that you would appoint representatives for all evil spiritual forces that are present. Your representatives, Lord. We command all evil spiritual forces to be bound to the representatives that the Lord Jesus has appointed. You will only manifest and communicate with each other as Jesus allows and requires. You may not assist each other in any way, and you must be cut off from all outside spiritual forces. You must now return to Jesus and to each and every one of us, whoever, insert your name. Everything that you have stolen from, from my sister, my brother, from us, you must be stripped away from and release every part of each one of us, each one of our, our minds. You must be stripped away from and release every part of my mind, of Ralph's mind, of Ray's mind, of whomsoever. Fill the gap in for your name. You must be stripped of all your schemes and plans, agendas and orders, and lay all of these at the feet of the Lord Jesus right now. Lord Jesus, we submit to you the issue of compliance. We ask that you would deal with all evil spiritual forces that would fail to comply. And in the name of Jesus, we command all evil spiritual forces, at the moment that you fail to comply, you will immediately go to the true Lord Jesus, and you'll deal with him directly. And so we thank you, Father, that we stand together, Jesus, we stand together with you, and we affirm the truth in faith, that you are here with us and that you love us, that even as we speak, you are preparing the way in the spiritual realm for each and every one of us for forgiveness, for deliverance, for healing, and for freedom. And we thank you, Lord, and we release our prayers, the victory that you've already accomplished through your death and resurrection, and the healing that you've already provided through all of your wounds. Lord, you know each one of our names. And... <laughs> We call, I call myself, I call each and every one of us. I call Ralph, I call Ray, I call, I, I call, I just, oh, I just, mm, I call Shan and, and I call, Carolyn, I call, I, I, I call, I call Jason, I call Christine, Kelly, Robert, I call each and every one right now. Hmm. 
and Deb, and I called Deb, I called Deb, <laughs> their whole mind and heart, I call every single part of each one of you forward. Help every part of each one of your, your, your sweet people to hear your voice and to know the truth about your heart and character, about your gentleness and your carefulness, so that each one of you and each one of us, our whole mind and heart can cooperate with your healing work, Lord. I say guide every th thought, image, memory, and emotion, and physical sensation that's coming into each and every one of us here and in the atmosphere. Awareness, and I ask the same guidance for myself. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are true to your word, that you answer when we call on your name, you answer us. And we know that you, <laughs> we have what we ask for when we ask according to your will. And it is your will that each and every one of us would come into that greater revelation knowledge of who you are. And I thank you, Lord, for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. So we're going to do something slightly different tonight, and it's kind of a... But just come along with me. Um, I am going to start, uh, for those of us that are here, we do have, um, you know, some, some of the printed material. And then there will be material later that you won't have that I'm going to go with from a, like from a different uh, source. So, you know, as you may be aware of, if you've been following along at all, what we are looking at were not only Bible, but book study and more of learning how to embrace trust. So embracing trust. Learning, it's that art. It is an art. It takes practice. It doesn't happen overnight. But the art of letting go and holding on to a forever faithful God. And so that's the journey that we're taking together and, you know, and, and go, tr going deeper, deeper in trusting him, embracing the truth of who he is as our king, and learning how to let go of stuff that is stuff. Amen. Stuff that does not have, you know, value in trusting him. And so we're starting, um, this is, uh, you know, this is titled on this, but it's a part three now in the book. And so there's a, just like, it's almost like a, decree or a declaration or whatever entitled holding on and it's written by lisa turkhurst she writes lord i finally understand i don't have to fully understand each thing that happens for me to trust you i don't have to try and figure it out control it or even like it for that matter in the midst of uncertainties I will just stand and I will say, I trust you, Lord. You are the perfect match for my every need. I am weak, but you are strength. I am unable, you are, cap you are capability. I am hesitant, you are fulfillment. Oh, pardon me, I got that one wrong. I am hesitant. Let's try this again, because you see... We make these little mistakes, but that's okay. You are assurance. Amen. I am desperate. You are fulfillment. Amen. I am confused. You find we're confused sometimes. <laughs> but Lord, you are confidence. I am tired. But you are rejuvenation. Though the long path is uncertain before us, Lord, you are so faithful to shed just enough light for me to see the very next step. So I'm seeking slivers of light in your truth just for today and filling the gaps of my unknown with trust. I think we can, every one of us can kind of identify with a lot of that, you know in various different stages or days, you know, as we go along. So now we're, we're just going to go on with, like, believing God. Like, in John eleven forty, he says, Did I not tell you that if you believe, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So the author writes, 
she says, I remember being little and learning. She says, remember being little and learning to swim? Well, for me, that doesn't work because I never did learn how to swim. And I might have been little, but my parents were not swimmers. We never went anywhere where I could be taught swimming. So for most people, this could be true. But anyway, her, her story and what her experience is, and she would, said, my dad would stand in the water several feet from the edge of the pool with outstretched arms. Come on, honey, jump, he'd say. I'll catch you. But I'd just stand there shaking my head, teeth chattering and knees knocking together as my polka dot swimsuit dripped puddles on that concrete floor or ledge. Jump, I'd think. Is he crazy? Wasn't it enough that I'd let him take me into the water up to my armpits? Like, really? If I jumped, my head might go under the water, and heaven only knows I don't care for that myself. Um, and if that happened, a little girl could drown, after all. The fact that he kept spitting out water out of his mouth like a whale and grinning like a maniac did nothing to inspire confidence. But finally, with a few more assurances and promises of ice cream, I took the leap. Arms flung out wide, I launched myself from the safety of, con of the concrete into the liquid unknown. It was all or nothing now. Everything committed, no turning back. It felt like eternity, but it was only a moment before I found myself safe in Daddy's arms. Oh, there was water in my eyes, and I was spitting like a whale. My head felt suspiciously wet, as though I'd gone under. But all my hesitation was swallowed up by one glorious realization. It was fun, really fun. Why in the world had I held back? My father had caught me just as he had promised. Do it again, Daddy, I shouted. Let's do it again. And so she writes, and this is what it is with our trustworthy father. Our Heavenly Father. I wonder how many adventures we miss simply because we don't trust God. How much joy and wonder we forfeit because we don't believe that He can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. That's from Ephesians 3.20. With evidence of God's power all around us, from the complexity of the universe down to the intricate nature of the human cell. You'd think we'd spend some of our, most of our time bragging about God like the kid down the block. You think your dad is great. Well, you ought to see mine. He can do absolutely anything, so there. Instead, I've spent a lot of my life playing it safe, venturing only as far as what seemed plausible in my own strength only believing for things within reach. Trusting God as long as I could see Him, feel Him, and understand Him, but not daring to leap beyond my comfort zone, because at some level I wasn't sure He would catch me. Plus, I was afraid I would do it wrong. I think somewhere along the way to adulthood, most of us have lost our childlike in innocence and faith. Perhaps something happened and we deemed God unreliable. Perhaps people ridiculed our religious fervor and we stopped bragging about our Father and His power to save. Or perhaps we never quite managed to relinquish control long enough to leap into His arms. Whatever the cause, I think we'd all agree we don't believe God the way we should. Oh, we may believe in God, in the sense of acknowledging his existence. But according to James 2.19, that isn't enough. Hey, because even the demons believe and shuddered. As Christians, we, we've, we've believed on Jesus and trusted him for our salvation but if that's the sum total of our belief, we may miss the joy and peace in believing. Romans 15:13 is the reference there. We may miss the joy and peace in believing that the Bible promises. 
we do need to determine what we believe about God so that our minds line up with the scripture something that we'll discuss later on as we go along in this chapter. But we don't have to understand in-depth theology to prove our faith. For it isn't right thinking that gets us gold stars in heaven, as Abraham found out way back in Genesis. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So this statement appears first in Genesis 15:6. But the same thought is repeated three times in the New Testament. It's repeated in Romans 4.3, Galatians 3.6, and James 2.23. It's as if to emphasize the importance of it. Abraham believed God. That's what counted most in God's book. And if we want to please the Lord, we need to do the same. So in the first half of this book that we've gone through so far, the author says that she's focused on the importance of letting go to surrender. But now, as we come along here together, it's time to learn how to hold on in faith, believing God with all that we are, heart, mind, and soul, fully trusting he's everything that he says he is and that he will do everything he has promised in his word. Unfortunately, that kind of faith just doesn't come naturally. We need the Lord's help to believe as we should. So in learning, in learning to believe, the author writes, both of our older children and their spouses struggled with infertility. She says, John Michael and, and Cammie for eight years, Jessica and Lauren for five. Most of that time, the topic was so painful that we rarely talked about it. But oh, how we prayed. <clears throat> both couples had committed their lives to Jesus as children. Both loved the Lord and served him in ministry. Yet, as hard as it is to grasp, obedience doesn't necessarily guarantee blessing. Well, at least the tangible outward blessing that we often desire. I know God can give us a baby, Jessica told me several years ago as we talked over lunch. But what if he doesn't want to? She bit her lip to keep back the tears. Can I be okay with that? I'm trying to be. Tears streamed down both of our faces as I grabbed her hand across the table. There are promises in scripture concerning the blessing of children. It's found in Psalm 128.3 and the gifts of a godly lineage in Psalm 127 verses 3 to 5. But we both understood that doesn't happen for everyone. So Jessica and Lauren were open to the idea of adoption and had served as foster parents for several years. But their desire for biological children just would not go away. So together we took that desire to the Lord and laid it before him, asking for a miracle, but also requesting strength to believe in his goodness, no matter how he chose to respond. But honestly, that's the bottom line when it comes to belief, especially concerning David's words in Psalm 27, 13, where he said, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm grateful for this beautiful promise, but we need to be careful where we put the emphasis. If we're looking for good things rather than the goodness of the Lord, when life goes wrong and stays wrong, despair will be the result. If we're looking for good things rather than the goodness of the Lord, that's worth noting. But when we look for God in our situation, trusting that his love and perfect wisdom are always at work, we won't get mired in the quicksand of unbelief or desperation. For whether he answers our specific requests, we'll still be able to see God's goodness. And if we'll ask, he will even multiply the faith that we lack. Everything is possible for one who believes 
That's what Jesus told the father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark 9.23. But rather than going away dejected, believing the miracle was dependent on him, we have to do a flip the page here. Sorry, guys. <laughs> the father looked to Jesus for the healing of his son and helped to increase his faith. So he says, I do believe, he said. Help me overcome my unbelief. That's in verse 24. As the father trusted in the Lord and his ability to heal, Jesus rebuked the demons and the boy was delivered, in verses 25 to 27. For it wasn't the strength of the man's faith, but the object of his faith that made the difference. It's an important thing to consider when we are struggling to believe. Am I placing my faith in a specific outcome, or am I placing my faith in God alone? That's on page 166. I'm going to repeat that. Is it, it's an important thing to consider when we are struggling to believe. Am I placing my faith in a specific outcome, or am I placing my faith in God alone? Now we're going to do a flip back and just touch on the inserted page here portion back on beside page 164 for those following along. It says, what to do with doubt? Honest doubt doesn't cancel honest faith. Hmm, think about that. The pendulum of hope often swings wildly between belief and unbelief. But while God isn't threatened by our questions... I do believe there's an important boundary we must not cross if we want to stay close to the Lord. There's a pastor and an author by the name of Barnabas Piper who identifies two types of doubt. Unbelieving doubt, which leads us away from faith, or believing doubt, which leads us to deeper faith. It's kind of a concept to try and grasp that one, I think. Two types of doubt. One is unbelieving doubt, which would lead us away from faith. Two, or believing doubt, which leads us to a deeper faith. So as we read through the following pairs of statements by Piper, we can check the one that you think is the most true of you right now. So here you go. So keep in mind, which one of each of these statements do you believe is the most true of you when you're doing a little your own self-check? Unbelieving doubt asks questions in order to challenge. Hmm. Believing doubt asks questions in order to learn. Unbelieving doubt takes questions to anyone but Jesus. Believing doubt takes questions directly to Jesus. You know, I think most of us could identify with various different stages or times of our life and or people that we've been in interaction with, you know, at various different times. The unbelieving doubt takes questions to anyone but Jesus. They go around asking this person and that person and that person and the other person, but they haven't taken it directly to Jesus. So where do you stand? You know, which, which one of those is true for you to this point? Unbelieving doubt questions God's character because he is beyond our understanding. Believing doubt, on the other hand, trusts in God's character because he is beyond our understanding. Unbelieving doubt says, not your will, but mine be done. You do it my way, God. That's what I'm telling you. I want you to do this my way. But believing doubt says, not my will, but yours be done. That's what Jesus said. Yet not my will, but your will be done. So that difference might be subtle in each one of those, but just consider how one type of doubt presses you close to the Father's heart, while the other drags you away. So invite Holy Spirit to reveal any other unbelieving doubt that may be affecting your faith. Take that before the Lord. Repent of any unbelief and ask God to bring his truth to that place. 
For just as he did for Thomas, Jesus wants to help you stop doubting and to believe. And that's from John 20, verse 27. And in Luke 22, 32, it says, But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So Jesus himself prays for us that our faith may not fail. What better intercessor do we have than him on our side? So now I'm going to go over to, I'm going to take a sidestep away from the embracing trust, and I'm going to do a little sidebar here. Uh, it's, from, it's from exposing the spiritual roots of disease. And I know this sounds like off topic, but I think if we take a look, we can see where doubt, unbelief, and some of the, um, how it's all related, what goes on here and here is related sometimes to, and oftentimes to our health. Um, and so this one in particular that I'm taking to highlight, and there's many more, but a common thing amongst amongst so many people are allergies. People, you know, there's aller allergies to this, there's hay fever, there's this, there's that, allergic to pets, allergic to this or the, at, or the other thing. And so this is from, like, Henry, Henry Wright, who... He's not a medical doctor. He does have medical background, but he's not a doctor per se. But he has done um, a great work as, as far as the Word of God and who God is for each and every one of whatever ailments may come our way and what's the spiritual root of these things. Mm -hmm. So there's there are spiritual roots for almost every one of the illnesses that we come against. And, and as he says, it's not God's will that we be sick. It's his will that we walk in health and wholeness and healing. But, you know, in this world that we live, it's um, we can get caught up in, in all the stuff that comes at us and on us. So I'm just going to take from, you know, as far as, uh, and I'll just read the scripture for, uh, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. And that's from 1 John 4.18. And a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. So as he goes through, it'll help us to understand where some of these connections are with allergies, for example. And, and he tells a story of, you know, where he was helping to walk some people through some very difficult, so I'm just going to tell, it's an anecdote uh, that he's referring to someone that um, he helped along her way, and he calls her Margaret. He says, early in my journey of helping people, I received a phone call from a woman who was desperate. Margaret had spent 10 years in near seclusion in a sanitary room with no carpeting and little furniture. She had become allergic to nearly everything in her environment because we've heard of environmental al allergies that a lot of people these days seem to be um, bombarded with this type of thing or told that this is what their allergies are, you know, by the medical community. She couldn't spend time with or even eat with her husband and children. She was down to eating only one or two foods each day. Marta explained that her medical, medical diagnosis was multiple chemical sensitivity slash environmental illness or MCS slash EI, which is a diagnosis given to someone who has an allergic reaction to many common chemicals in their environment, such as pesticides, perfumes, plastics, clothing, carpeting, and certain foods. There's a wide range of chronic symptoms, including headaches, muscle and joint pain, fatigue, rashes, asthma, memory loss, and confusion. That's a lot of stuff. Her doctors were convinced that the root of her allergies was an exposure to pesticides that had completely destroyed her immune system. 
So Margaret explained that her ailment, she explained her ailments, pardon me, and then she pleaded with me, Oh, Pastor Rate, please come here to see me, she says. I can't leave my room or fly on a plane. It will cost me my life. I was surprised by her request. Margaret lived on the other side of the country. And at that point, I had never traveled for ministry. Quietly, I prayed and then responded. Okay, Margaret, I don't know what I can do for you, but I will give you ten days of my life. On the plane later that week, I opened my Bible to search for answers. James 1.5 tells us, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally, liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him, or he withholds not. So I asked, Sir, I, I said, Lord, this is a disease I know nothing about, and I'm going to minister to a stranger who I know nothing about. What am I doing? Have I lost my mind? I searched the scriptures to see if there was anything at all that was related to pesticides or environmental illnesses. Then the Lord led me to Proverbs 17:22, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. As I meditated on that scripture, I thought about the way God has created our bones. There's much more to them than what we usually think about. The hard skeleton that enables us to stand and move. And in the center of our bones, there's this spongy material called bone marrow that is continually, continuously producing our red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The white blood cells play a vital role in our immune system. God has created them to fight against invading bacteria, viruses, and fungi to help destroy all harmful invaders in our bodies. We can't exist without a healthy immune system. So he says, as I was meditating on Proverbs 17.22, a broken spirit dries the bones. Hmm, I thought, what could that mean, Lord? Could it mean a broken spirit or a broken heart? Drives up, dries up the soft tissue of the bone marrow? Affects the white blood cells? and destroys the immune system? I began to wonder, Lord, who broke this woman's heart? And so then he kind of titles Healing of a Broken Heart. So when I arrived, the first thing the family asked me was, has God shown you anything? I turned to this very ill woman and I asked, Margaret, who has damaged you? Who was supposed to love you but didn't? Who has put this kind of dread or fear within you? After a few quiet moments, she met me not with words, but with tears. It says, I spent seven days of ministry with Margaret, helping her to understand the power of God's words, word and how much he loved her. No matter what had happened in her life, her relationship with him was not broken. We went through the steps of forgiveness and the elimination of painful hurts that she had experienced. We also began to cast down the fearful thoughts that had brought her to a place of isolation, and a fear of loving or being and being loved. Margaret embraced God's word, which assured her that his perfect love would destroy the fear in her life. And again, 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. I explained to her what the fear and isolation had done to weaken her immune system. At the end of seven days of receiving the truth of God's word, Margaret walked out of her room for the first time in years. She had no allergic reactions as she moved through the rooms in her home and sat with her husband and children at the table. Later that day, I went with her entire family to dinner at a steak restaurant called Sizzlers. I, think we, I remember Sizzlers from back in the day. She was able to eat everything on that buffet. No allergic reactions. Margaret finally understood that she was loved by God and that she could love herself. Her broken heart was healed. So he writes, what is a broken heart? Well, if we have a broken heart or a broken spirit, we have been pierced perhaps because of verbal, physical, or sexual abuse. So I better make sure I'm keeping myself on track. So, <clears throat> yeah, we're good. 
The enemy takes these tragedies and tempts us to become bitter, full of self-hatred and fearful of relationships. And if we allow that to happen, the piercing will turn into a deep wound that does not heal unless the issues are dealt with. What we have in the end is a broken heart. These are wounds that go the very deepest because someone who was supposed to love us and take care of us has betrayed us. A broken heart does not allow a person to give and receive love without fear. They're filled, filled with an intense fear that no one can be trusted and that they can never love or be loved by anyone again. The fear makes them guarded so that they retreat into themselves, which leads to isolation. The person who suffers from a broken heart also believes that no one understands the pain that they feel. And he writes, my doctorate is in Christian therapeutic counseling. He says, do you know how many people that I have grieved with in ministry? Anybody that's in this field of therapeutic counseling could certainly identify. He says, I have sat and wept with thousands of men and women whose hearts have been broken. So if you are suffering from a broken heart, I know you from the inside out. You are trapped within your own self. You have so much fear and even self-loathing because you were not loved properly. And then he's got you know, a bit of a title for my life, he says. He says, when I read Proverbs 17.22, that a broken spirit dries up our bones, I realize the connection between thought and disease when it comes to people suffering from multiple allergies. The Lord showed me that the common spiritual root of these multiple allergies, such as this MCS slash EI, and simple allergies as well, is fear. That's the common spiritual root, is fear. In Margaret's case, the fear produced by her broken heart would not let her give and receive love in her relationships. Many people who have MCS slash EI whom I've encountered have suffered from emotional, verbal, or sexual abuse by a parent or someone else close to them. And as a result, they are afraid to love without fear. And remember, the Bible says that fear has torment. <clears throat> Their tormented thought life of self-rejection and fear keeps them in bondage. Their freedom and healing will come from embracing the truth in God's word. Embracing truth, embracing trust. That's how I'm connecting these dots. Their freedom and healing will come from embracing the truth in God's word regarding how he sees them. From accepting that he is a God who loves them. Recently, a woman named Kim, he says, attended one of my, one of our my one of our for my life week long retreats. So he holds retreats monthly, apparently, at their place. Um, Kim had been diagnosed with MCS and e, the slash EI and was down to eighty one pounds. There was only three foods left that she could eat. Because she knew that she was dying, she had traveled to another state to visit her adult son one last time to say goodbye. You know, this makes me think of people who maybe suffer from anorexia and bulimia or any of those eating disorders. It kind of reminds me of folks that could fall into this category. Thankfully, someone invited Kim to a For My Life retreat, and she decided to search for healing one more time. During that week, Kim learned that God's perfect will is for health, health for his children. She received God's truth for her and began to gain back her life. Over the next months, Kim embraced the path of freedom from disease. She walked out the word of God in forgiveness. She cast down fearful thoughts and renewed her mind in the word of God. 
Since then, she has gained 50 pounds and is healthy again. Kim and her husband now travel, enjoying life and God's creation together. She is another testament that the Father's love and the power of His word to heal are always greater than Satan's plan. And what's his plan to kill, steal, and destroy, right? So what has changed for thousands of people like Kim around the world who have been healed of their allergies after hearing such teachings and these teachings? They chose to believe the Word of God and to renew their minds by embracing the law of God and not the law of sin. Their bodies responded to God's Word. The hypersensitivity and inflammation associated with allergies were healed. Their immune system systems were healed and their hearts were made whole. So this is one of those areas, you know, that he said, like, even, even now he's referring to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He says the prim even that, even they connect the primary spiritual root of allergies. According to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, allergies are the sixth leading cause of chronic illness in the U.S. So how could this plague be, plague be affecting Christians as well when Psalm 103.3 says that God forgives all of our iniquities and heals all our diseases? What's the solution to this disconnect in believers' lives? So the reference here is to the simple definition of allergies on the Internet, and it it finds responses like an allergy is an abnormal reaction by your immune system to a substance that is usually not harmful. What kind of substances? Pollen, animal fur, flowers, perfumes, peanuts, eggs, milk, you name it. Milk products, shellfish, fibers, and more. Having allergies would mean that you're allergic to God's creation, things that he meant for you to enjoy, and that's not God's plan. According to the medical researchers, they don't believe that allergies can be healed. But again, yeah. they don't know what our God can do. So they manage the symptoms only with antihistamines and other medicines. But the Word of God has proven that people can be completely healed of allergies and many other things. And he says, I believe that God has shown me that the root cause that truly lies, has, God has shown me the root cause that truly lies behind the allergies. And that's, do we doubt and not believe? Amen. Do we trust him? Do we not? So based on that, um, based on that, That once again to emphasize that the primary spiritual root cause of allergies, both multiple or simple, is fear. Especially fear in our relationships. And that'll be something to look at at another time and another place, but to look into fear as a root for so many, uh, so many, a spiritual root for so many disorders. It's unbelievable how how much that is tied in to various different types of disorders. But that'll be another day, another time, and probably another venue. Maybe a message on a Sunday, you never know. But we'll see how the Lord wants to direct that, and we leave that up to Him. So just, <clears throat> I think it in, uh, we can look, is there anything that stood out, you know, in any of this? That might ca that caught the attention particularly. Just the, pr the principal scripture. I don't, I'm not sure where it is, but, mm -hmm. uh, but when you were talking about all those things, and that is, uh, I think it's in Proverbs. Mm -hmm. It says, "A merry heart does good yeah. like a medicine. Yes, right. So if anything is disturbing natural joy, yes. your natural joy and or your joy in the Lord, Right. anything that steals your joy yep. is going to change 
Well, it's going to do the verse. Uh, yes. Of the medicine. Right. That's true. You're, right. That's a good. That's good. So they. Yeah. 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 So deep, yeah. deep healing of uh, mm-hmm. spiritual wounds and hearts. Right. In hearts and minds and. Yeah. Uh, are bound to result in uh, disease. And. Yeah. A whole lot of those are are going to not show up as physical as mental diseases. And there's that component too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because if you're constantly in fear and in doubt, uh, you're going to believe every lie of the enemy. Mm-hmm. You're not love That's right. He cares. Blah blah blah. You'd be better off to kill yourself. And, and we know. Yeah, and we know that doubt and unbelief is sin in and of itself. It's a sin that we need to repent of. Mm-hmm. So that was the mm-hmm. thing I picked No, that's that. good. That's there really a good. A couple other little things, but as yeah. we going, to go back to them would be a distraction. <laughs> no, but that is good. You know, cause it's, so I think for each and every one of us, we can find things that kind of spoke to us and sort of caught our attention, maybe more than one thing. But definitely food for thought. Yeah. And the best food for thought is the word of God. To we think on his word, and if we take his word as food, think on that, get more of that here, and less of the other stuff that comes at us, um, not believing the lies, you know? I yes. I forgot to turn this microphone on. Hmm? Now I can say what I said again. <laughs> sure, go for it. It doesn't hurt to hear that again, that's for sure. Yes. Uh, the, the, the number one thing, now that I've turned the microphone on so that you can hear me in the background. <laughs> <laughs> we had a little rehearsal, that's all. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I said the scripture, and I, I believe it's in Proverbs, where it, it says, A merry heart does good like a medicine. Right. Yeah. And so that uh, if you anything messes with your natural happiness in your heart right. or your joy in the Lord. Anything yeah. that interferes with your joy yeah. in the Lord yeah. is going to have a negative effect. Right. And if your joy in the Lord is big and strong, right. it's going to be healthy. It's going to be the right healing medicine. to your bones. Yeah. It's going to be strength for your bones. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just leave it with that. Uh, if, if you have issues, oh, and we did mention that uh, I, I believe that that same attack of the enemy on your joy yeah. uh, results in a whole lot of people having mental issues. There's fear and doubt and all kinds of things and lies that they believe from the enemy yep. because they don't, I don't have a confidence right. and joy in their heart that God loves them, that they're yeah. cared for. That's right. And yeah. so a merry heart does good like a medicine. Yes, it does. Amen. It's good medicine. Good medicine. So I think we'll we'll close out with. Um, I'm just going to, um, for, unless there's anything else. No. Um, just I take this from from a, a book from Pray the Word, the 31 prayers that touch the heart of God. So it's praying the word. And this one's titled "I Will Not Fear." So it says, as you pray in the midst of whatever trial that you presently find yourself, where whatever trial that might be and look like, choose to worship God for who he is. So we read, Father, how desperately I need your help in aligning my heart with the truth of your word. With my mouth, I would say that you are in the midst of, I would say that you are in the midst of the difficulties of my life working them together for my good, but the unease in my heart says otherwise. Help me, O God, by the power of your Spirit at work in me, change my heart. Remove fear and make me fearless. Remove timidity and make me bold for your kingdom. Remove doubt and unbelief and increase my faith. For I will remember your deeds, Lord, the miracles that you have done in my life as I have journeyed towards you. I will meditate on all your works and think about many mighty things that you have done for me. 
I purpose this day to worship you alone. I will bow to no other God. Because you are my God, my refuge and strength, I will not fear even though trouble may seem to surround me. Because of your great love for me, I know that you will rescue me. Amen. You will protect me, be with me, and deliver me. Because you are my God, and you have redeemed me and called me by name. You will be with me when I pass through the waters of adversity. I will not drown. The swift current of the trial of disappointment that I find myself in, or whatever that trial may be, will not sweep me away. The fiery trial of sickness or loneliness or financial instability or fill in your blank will not set me ablaze. For you are the Lord my God, the Holy One of Israel, my Savior. Therefore I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell you of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you and sing praise to your name. For my hope is in your unfailing love that is at work on my behalf, for my good and to make me more like Jesus. Seal this work to my heart, I pray. And in the beautiful name of the one who died to make me yours, Jesus. Amen. So that scripture references for all the, the parts of that prayer is from Romans 8.28, Isaiah 29.13, Isaiah 41.10, 2 Timothy 1, seven, Mark 9.24, Psalm 77.10-15, Daniel 3.16-18, Psalm 91 verses 14.15, Isaiah 41, 1-3, Psalm 9 verses 1 and 2, Psalm 33.18, and Romans 8.28. So that's the, the scripture that we just prayed through right there. And to back it all up. So the Lord bless you as we go for another week. And we want to say thank you so much for taking time, for joining with us, and take to heart and ask the Lord to show you any areas where there might be, you know, where, where there may be fear that's lurking. It may be some place that, you know, you, you, the Lord brings to your mind that where you've not felt loved or, you know, or well taken care of. And just to forgive each one where there might be that place and take God's word at, at, at face value and apply it to every situation. For his love casts out, his perfect love casts out fear every single time. In Jesus' name, until next week, we'll see you again. Bye-bye. Okay,